Welcome to the True Tone Lounge. I'm your host, Zach Childs. Today is not your usual True Tone Lounge. Today, to celebrate the company's 25th anniversary, we're sitting down with True Tone's founder and president, Bob Weil. Thank you. We're going to have Bob tell us his, uh, his story, which is True Tone's story. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to start from, from when he was a kid and, and you know, and with a, a dream of, of starting a company because of a volume pedal that he didn't like, mm-hmm. all the yeah. way to being, you know, one of the uh, premier effects and power supplies company in the, in the MI field. Yeah. So, so Bob, thank you for, uh, for allowing this. And, uh, and well, we I had can... to drive a long way. Uh, you know. <laughs> I know your my, office is. My office is, well, 20 feet that way. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, but I, I made it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob, Tell us uh, when music really became important to you. Gosh, uh, it kind of evolved, I think. Um, I grew up in a, uh, not a terribly musical household, other than my mom, okay. uh, Phyllis, whom you know. Uh, yeah. my, my mom, for those of the folks out there that don't know, she's actually our bookkeeper. She's 88 and she's still cranking amazing. Yeah. But uh, she uh, played piano. We always had a piano in our house. Uh, just an upright, but it was, you know, a decent one. And she would play Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven and Claire de Lune, I think it was uh, mm-hmm. WC, if I remember right, um, and played it beautifully. And she would just play those two tunes, maybe a few other things, just occasionally, uh, just whenever she felt like sitting back down at the piano kind of thing. Um, my dad was completely tone deaf, which is hilarious. But <laughs> and what did your dad do? He uh, sold advertising. Yeah. Which I'll, I'll get back to that later. Yeah. Great salesman, uh, but tone deaf. So yeah. not a great musician. <laughs> Loved music, but couldn't sing. Um, but anyhow, so, so that was kind of my earliest things, was just hearing mom play this beautiful classical music on the piano. Uh, and then, let's see, gosh, I was involved in like, you know, children's choir, boys' choir, whatever at church when I was, you know, a kid. You know, picture me in red and white robes. It was glorious. Yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, uh, but then, let's see, once my voice changed, I uh, couldn't do that anymore. Um, but a few years later, got involved with a, uh, a traveling singing group at church. Uh, I grew up in, in, at, at that point in Connecticut. Um, was born in Long Island. Thank God I didn't retain the accent. No offense to all you in Long Island, but, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but grew up otherwise in Connecticut and uh, in a relatively large church for that area, um, you know, over a thousand people kind of thing. And so there's a big, huge youth group and, and uh, this traveling singing group that I was involved in. Um, and it was in there that I, I realized, uh, you know, I, I didn't have like a lead voice, but I had a good bass and baritone voice. So I, I led the bass section of the, of, the, of the group and had, you know, a lot of great friends there and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that was where music really started to click. Plus, uh, within that group of people, there were a couple of guys that played guitar. Um, my buddy Keith, he had a, uh, he had, he was the first one that I knew that had an electric guitar. Uh, which a couple of years later, I ended up buying his electric from him. It was an Ibanez something from mm-hmm. the '70s, two, you know, twin humbuckers. And uh, and I remember going over to Keith's house and picking up his electric guitar. Plugged into something, you know, whatever little amp he had, and playing, you know, the one note version of Twenty Five or Sixty Four by the by Chicago, you know, the one note version of Smoke on the Water, you know. <laughs> um, but I hadn't actually gotten my own guitar at that point, so all I could do was the one note thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I ended up getting my own first acoustic guitar. It was was my first guitar, just a generic name Ventura or something like that acoustic guitar uh, shortly before my 17th birthday and just fell in love with the instrument I you know just you know like Brian Adams sang I nearly played until my fingers bled yeah <laughs> instead of summer of 69 it was probably the summer of 79 or 80 I guess that that, that happened and uh, could not put the thing down just kept on banging out chords and all that kind of stuff um, so that was when music was really starting to pop, you know, for me personally. I, the guitar went with me everywhere. Wow. I would not leave home without it kind of thing. And uh, also, um, I had a, a good friend at that time, uh, Todd Schneider, who 
was a child prodigy guitar player when he was, gosh, like 14 or so. He had a jazz fusion band with other kids from the area uh, who were also prodigies. And they would play at clubs that they were way too young to even get into, but they, they got hired to play there. Wow. And uh, so, you know, a couple years into that, I would go out and see them and uh, check out what they were doing. He was a year, maybe a year younger than me. But yeah, amazing guitar player. And he taught me pretty much everything I know, mostly to this day, because I plateaued a while ago, <laughs> as you do. Um, but yeah, he would, but he practiced a lot more than I ever did. I mean, I loved the instrument, didn't want to put it down, but when it came to actually practicing, you know, he'd say, hey, Bob, have you been practicing your Dorian's or whatever? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah I did that for 10 minutes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Takes a bit more than that to start playing Larry Carlton tunes and right. all that kind of thing. Yeah. So when did you pick up an electric guitar? And oh, that that only took a few months. Yeah. A few months of banging on the acoustic. I'm like, yeah, I want to play the cool yeah. thing. You know? Now, were you buying these instruments with your own money, or were your parents buying them for you? Or? Uh, I saved up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, had various low level teenage jobs. You know, cutting people's lawns. Uh, caddying at the golf course, yeah. um, you know that kind of thing. So yeah, you yeah. you uh, you earned earned you know you earned the money and you uh, you know yeah. picked them picked them up with you. Yeah, yeah, very nice. At some point, you you meet your wife Julie, mm -hmm. and uh, you dis and of course you you went to you went to college. What and what did that's you where I met Julie? Actually, okay. yeah. Okay, what university were you at? Oh, it's uh, technically. I'm an alumni of Gordon College, which is a college just north of Boston. Okay. Um, but I actually went to Barrington College. It actually closed and merged with Gordon College okay. the year after I graduated. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's thus the, you know, yes. the yes. Catholic thing. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, Julie actually had transferred in uh, at the just before my senior year. And I was you know, helping out with orientation and spotted her. And mm -hmm. after some months of me trying to reel her in, mostly unsuccessfully, she finally gave in. And she kind of the rest is history. We've been married for over 33 years now. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So what did you get your degree in? Uh, business administration. Okay. Yeah. Now, at, at some point you move out to California. Mm-hmm. And you got a job with Air New Zealand. Am, am I getting the timeline right? Or? Uh, you are. You're, yeah. Can I fill in some blanks? Yeah, please. Okay. Because there, there's some. There were some interesting things that happened on on the road to that. Um, so yeah, I, I never tried to become a uh, you know a guitarist for hire, a professional guitar player. I, I knew that I was a you know halfway decent guitar player, but I just. I was too distracted by too many other things and, and I didn't want to put in all the hours needed. And plus I had a lot of my dad's voice in my head saying, you know, you got to have an income. Yeah. And the musicians I knew, you know, they were always doing a few different things plus music in order to get by. And I was like, I just, you know, I just want to have a job and, and all that and, and, and play as much as I can yeah. outside of that, you know? So, um, Julie and I got married uh, in, in Connecticut and, um, at the time, I was working for the company that my dad was the VP of sales of, okay. uh, called Harris Publishing Company. And he had sold advertising for them for many years. He was, like I said, a great salesman. Um, and he taught me everything I pretty much ever learned about sales. He, he would you know, literally listen to me on the phone with, with people and he'd give me some constructive feedback after the phone calls. At times it got to be a little much and be like, Dad, I got it. You know? but, but most of the time it was, Fantastic feedback, best sales training I could have ever had. You know, wow. Um, and so I, I did uh, really well working there with him uh, for uh, the first year of the marriage between Julie and I. And then I guess I did well enough that the company wanted me to move out to LA to revive a, a stagnant sales ter territory for them out there. So Julie and I were stoked about that. We we, we were you know we ended up a year after being married. We we drove out to California. Uh, singing California Dream in the whole way, you know. Uh, <laughs> we, were just, we were kids. We got married when I was 23. <coughs> she was 22, you know. So we had stars in our eyes. We're like, we're going to Southern California. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the land of milk and honey. It is, totally, yeah. yeah. So we uh, went out there and um, 
I was I, I was good at what I did. So you know, within a, a year or so, I, I had revived the sales territory. You know, they were making good money off of it. Um, after a little over a year and a half, year and a half to two years almost, um, I made a really dumb career move. You, you see, by by this time, I had already. Uh, had the the first ideas, the first basic rough ideas of uh, a visual volume pedal. Okay. So, um, I I quit Harris Publishing and thought I need to just keep working on this prototype, which we'll get into more in a minute. But you know, just jumping ship out of the day job way too soon. All of a sudden, I realized, oh gosh, we're burning through cash like crazy. Imagine that living in Southern California, yeah, with no income. <laughs> So I ended up like doing a multi-level thing that somebody talked me into selling water filters and then I was like, yeah, this isn't working after a couple of months. And, uh, and then a buddy of mine who was from New Zealand worked at Air New Zealand in LA and he convinced me to come over there and, and get a job that actually paid some money, although not nearly the money I had been making at Harris Publishing. Wow. <laughs> And, and the Harris Publishing gig was cush, yeah. too. I could work out of our apartment, set my own hours. I could have been developing this company idea, yeah, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah. You could have been mistake. doing it as a side hustle. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. were you getting advice from your dad, and you were in, or were you not talking to him about this? Uh, oh, no, no. He, he was, he, uh, he did, I mean, he, he gave me a lot of slack, or a lot of, yeah. room. he's like, you know, Bob's married and off on his own, he's out in California. Yeah. But he, he would, on the phone calls and stuff, he'd be like, are you sure that's what you want to do, Bob? And I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, dad, I got this. Yeah. And I had no idea. Just <laughs> no clue what I'm doing. I'm just a starry-eyed kid living in LA. I, I should tell you about some of the early experiments that got me going in this direction. Yeah, though, absolutely, right? yes, okay. yes. Because uh, some of those were pretty comical, yeah. too. Um, so to begin with, you yeah. you had been using uh, you know a, a volume pedal and you and you didn't really like it, mm-hmm. and so most people would think, you know, oh whatever, I'll either use it or I won't. Right. You start thinking, you know, which is not the norm. You start thinking about I'm going to make something that's better than this, right? You know, or I'm going to modify or what have yeah. you. And so and then you then you start on this on this rabbit trail. Yeah. And so how did it start? Yeah, uh, well, just such a small world kind of thing. Uh, you know Bruce Adolf? He, he's yes. the publisher of uh, Worship Musician Magazine, formerly Christian Musician Magazine as well. And he's, he's pretty well known in, in musician circles, especially in Christian musician circles. Um, he had a guitar shop in just like, I don't know, 10 minutes away from where I lived in, in uh, Southern California. And that I used to go to when we first moved out there. And so just really a couple months after we moved there, I went into his guitar shop, didn't know him at all. I just, you know, he's, he's that long haired guy behind the counter, you know. Um, but I bought a, an Ernie Ball volume pedal from him. And after using it for a few months, I started to just get frustrated with it. It, yeah. it didn't have like a real smooth zero to 10 kind of taper. It was kind of nothing, nothing, nothing on, you know, kind yeah. of thing. And the main thing was it didn't have any visual reference, no zero to 10 scale. Yeah. And so I thought, well, that's weird. I mean, shoot, the knob of my guitar has zero to 10. My stereo has zero to 10. Why doesn't a volume pedal have zero to 10? So I started shopping around and asking everyone, does anybody make a volume pedal with a zero to 10 scale? No, nobody did. Yeah. So I just became obsessed with this idea to make my own. Because, I, you know, the Ernie Ball, you look at, look at it, there's inside the thing, which you can see right inside it, uh, there's a... There's a pot, a potentiometer, two jacks, a couple wires, and a string. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. And because when I worked at Harris Publishing, we actually sold advertising to the electronics industry, I knew what the parts were called, like potentiometer. I knew what that was mm-hmm. and other resistors, capacitors. I didn't know what they did, but I knew what to call them. Um, so I looked at it going, this is going to be easy. Well... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not so much. Not so much, <laughs> especially coming from a place of zero knowledge. I had no degree in engineering; yeah. didn't know anything about it. Yeah, and there's there's no internet. There's no internet. Yeah. No, yeah. this is so, 1989, yeah. 1990. So 1989, your, your options are either to go to school for that, yeah. or to go to the library, or to buy a book. 
I, I yeah. went to the library, I bought a couple books, started reading about electronic engineering, electrical engineering, electronic engineering. And um, not that I understood everything I was reading, but I picked up enough along the way to finally start cobbling together my own prototypes. Yeah. And it's funny, I just got a post on uh, Facebook just the other day from um, a buddy of mine in LA, Victor Leon, who helped me make my first prototype because he had a bandsaw. Okay. And I, yeah. I still have that. Victor, if you're watching this at some point, you gotta, you'll, you'll remember this. Um, so basically, I had this idea for a slide action okay. volume pedal. This, this used to have two bits of wood here so that this wouldn't just pop off. It would, you know, it would yeah. stay where it, was, yeah. where it was set. But in the two pieces of wood here and here both had zero to 10 markers on it. So this is more like a fader on a console. It's yeah. exactly a fader on a console okay. right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the fader uh, shaft would clip into this thing and, and these wheels that are, you know, like, uh, I don't know what they are, yeah. shower door wheels kind of thing. And then you've got jacks on the front Jacks here. on the front. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately at the time, knowing nothing about electronic engineering, uh, this didn't have any shielding in it because I didn't know what shielding was. Right. So the first time I plugged it in, I'm like, man, that's buzzing a lot. What, what the heck? And yeah. I talked to somebody who knew a little bit about, about electronics. He goes, do you have any shielding in there? I'm like, what shielding? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so then I lined it with aluminum foil and whatnot, and it, it worked. But yeah, but yeah so, so Victor helped me carve this thing out and put it together. But uh, So that that's a big step right there. Again, mm. you know, you've... You have this idea that you formulated in your head, right. and then and then you you start you know building a prototype, taking some parts because again, you know like where did you get these parts from? Oh well, let's see. The wheels came I think from Home yeah. Depot. Yeah. I think they were shower door rollers or yeah. something like that. But like the you know where did you get oh, the, the pitch yonder? Yeah. Well, I pulled out one of the electronic directories that I used to sell advertising in, uh -huh. found potentiometer suppliers and called them, and then sourced these. I got wow. samples, free yeah. samples, that you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so that that uh, and then advertising you... sales background, although you know, I never wanted to sell advertising again. It, there were it, it gave me just little kernels of knowledge that helped me to build on. Right. Know. And did you get these jacks from like Radio Shack or something, or did you get those from a parts company? Also? Those were probably Radio Shack, actually. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> but then this in this part, I, I know you've. You've laughed at this before, so I'll give you the opportunity yeah. again. Um, I wanted to. I noticed that when I put my foot on here, it was too flat. Yeah. My, it was just uncomfortable for my foot to slide that way. So I, I was walking the beach one day, mm -hmm. Redondo Beach or something, and I found this shell, which I've still kept because it's, it's just funny. Um, I found the shell, and I stuck it on here, and I put my foot on it, and I was like, oh, that feels better. Yeah. And you get a little roll there. And so I, I ended up carving... Again, with my buddy Victor's bandsaw, carving bits of wood that were in the shape of the shell. That worked better. Yeah, and so then you get, you know, like on, on a fader, you get what you would put your finger on. That's yeah, right. Because it's not like, yeah, it, usually it has a, an indention for, for your, yeah. Same, same kind of idea. Yeah. yeah. And then that eventually became this, which was the, the very first real working, semi-professional looking. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, slide volume pedal is what I call it. So yeah. how did you how did you make yeah. this? Who made this? Okay, this uh, let's see. The plastic ABS plastic case was like for um, some electronic project. Yeah, I think they called it electronic project case, or maybe it was for. Actually, they wouldn't have modems back then, so pre modem. Can you believe that? Wow. Uh, so yeah, it was something electronics project box. I think I got that from Master Electronics. Okay. Like a digi-key kind of thing. And I put twin faders in there for stereo volume. Uh, put the faders straight up and made this thing have two holes in it to hold the faders. Yeah. Um, this is still a wooden block, but it's on a metal frame. Right, you know, because you can see that that's very similar to the one you had before. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's the same profile. You've got some grip, kind of grip tape on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I got that idea from the Ernie Ball volume pedal, but it's just, yeah. you know, like skateboard or yeah. uh, stair. Tread. Um, I actually put a, a little press release with a picture into Guitar Player, which was free, I think, because it was just a press release. Yeah. Um, I think I made like 20 of these, put the press release out. I sold maybe 10 of them. 
just, you know, I, I made up a company name. It wasn't Visual Sound or anything. Yeah. It was Slide Music Company, I think. And um, sold a handful of them. You know, people sent me checks or money orders kind of thing. And, uh, and then that was that. But that was, this was the closest to a real product that I, that I could get. And my friends called it the banana peel, though, because, you know, putting your foot on it, you're like, whoa. You know. All right. Uh, so, so at this point, uh, what, were, were you still working for Air New Zealand? Yeah, I was, I was still working at Air New Zealand. Okay, when I, when so, this, this, yeah. so this is still a side hustle at this point. Oh, it's not yeah. even a side, it's a yeah. prototype. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you, you were able to sell some of them. Just a, yeah, like yeah. maybe 10 at most. And then, yeah. and then, you know, did you go into any kind of debt making these or doing any advertising or anything at this point? No. You know, at this point, you know, so it was all pretty, you know, kind of, you know, just a little experiment that you little did. A little experiment, yeah. 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 So what happens next? Uh, well, after this, so while we were in Southern California still, I was still working at Air New Zealand, uh, 1992, I guess it was, the Rodney King riots happened. Yeah. And our daughter had just been born two months before that. And we were, at that point, because of my disastrous career decisions, uh, we were living in Hawthorne, which at the time was not the best neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, Rodney King riots happened. There's stuff going on really close to where we live. We've got a baby. Yeah, you didn't feel safe. We didn't feel safe. Uh, you know, fled for a couple of days up to Palos Verdes, where thankfully friends of ours took us in just to get us out of that area. Yeah. Um, and that was that was the last straw. We were already becoming a little more and more sort of disillusioned with LA. We were like, yeah, we don't want to raise our kids here, you know. And so we we started making plans to move back to Connecticut at least at least okay. for a while. Yeah. Uh, that's where our family was and all that kind of stuff. A friend of mine in Connecticut gets me a job. We move back to Connecticut. Julie's eight months pregnant with our second child at that point. Mm -hmm. He's born shortly after we got there. <laughs> Heck of a time to move, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So were you singing, uh, what's the opposite of California dreaming as you were, <laughs> as you were leaving California? Got those, uh, let's see. <laughs> California yeah. blues. <laughs> New, New York on my mind? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's Georgia. Yeah, yeah never mind. <laughs> But so you, blues is what yeah. we're saying. But, yeah. So you so you moved back to back to Connecticut. Yeah. What was your job at that point? Um, well, the job that my buddy got me yeah. in Connecticut was to uh, sell uh, computer consulting services. Okay, uh, it ended up being more like a glorified headhunter job, which it wasn't my cup yeah. of tea at all. But it was it it it, it got us back home. It, it you know got us you know landing on our feet. We were you know. We had like no money at this point because Air New Zealand, a lot of cool perks. They flew me to New Zealand twice. It was amazing. Yeah. But uh, the pay was, yeah, not great. Not so by the time we got back to Canada, we're, we got no savings, nothing. We're just barely getting by. Uh, the job that I got was, you know, paid a bit more, but it's, you know, pretty expensive around that area. And so we're, we're struggling. You know, I, I last there for a year before starting actually Visual Sound because during that year, I started putting these prototypes together, okay. Um, which this is what launched the company. Actually, I'm skipping one, one thing that I, I really should show you because, again, the, the whole prototyping process is hilarious. I, 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 had, I was walking through Home Depot one day. This is what I used to do. I, I used to walk through Home Depot, look at stuff on the shelves, and get ideas for how can I either turn that into a product for oh. myself or, or make it part of a product. I kind of repurpose it, yeah. Yeah. So I saw some cabinet door handles and I saw cable ties. I put one and one together and I realized, you know, that might work as a pivot bracket. So I, I just hammered this together. There's a cabinet door handle mm -hmm. and cable ties, which act as a really good pivot bracket, providing just about the right angle for something that could be a volume pedal potentially. Um, and that turned into this, where I took a second cabinet door handle and made it the end stop. Mm -hmm. Again, using faders. Got two faders in there for stereo operation. And you've got those little plastic clamps. Cape, yeah, the yeah. cable clamps. Yeah, yeah they're uh, holding it in place. Yeah. And then there's a, like a plastic block inside there that held, the, held that steady. So this is a big leap forward. This is big. This is, this yeah. is what I've been spending time in L.A. learning about, is how to design a, a 10 LED circuit to yeah. go along with the volume circuit. With no background in electronics, that must have taken a lot of time. Well, I, I first got the idea, the very rough idea, like the slide thing in 88, 89, yeah. probably 89, I guess. And then 
by the time I got these built was the end of 94, beginning of 95. So six plus year. Yeah. You know, when you process. don't go to school for something and there's no yeah. internet, it takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it, it, uh, I had finally been able to figure out how to make a 10 LED. You know, as you move the pedal, it went, brrr, you know, zero to 10 and back. Um, and so I, I uh, left my employment at, you know, right around the end of 94, uh, packed up 20 of these that I had put together as, as prototypes. And did you build these yourself? I built them myself, yeah. Yeah. I had, I, obviously, I had to get some parts specially made, but um, this, I think this box here, I had it custom modified a bit. Okay. But I think it started out its life as a, um, uh, a modem box of some kind. Because <laughs> modem boxes were big at they that point. They were huge, yeah. 14.4K, yeah. you know. Right, woo, yeah. Smoking speed there. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, you know, again, just using parts that were available. Yeah. Uh, put this, put 20 of these together, packed them in my bag, flew out to the January NAM show in Anaheim. The big NAM show. Didn't have a booth. Yeah. Um, just because I <laughs> couldn't afford a booth. Yeah. Um, but I, I would walk in, I would smuggle a handful of these in, in like a big computer bag yeah. into the show. Yeah, because again, you know, the, the NAM show, you know, if you're wanting to show things, they want you to have a booth and such. They don't oh, yeah. want you to have a backpack full of stuff and no. going around showing it off to people. That's, that's what they don't want. Yeah, know? it would have been very yeah. frowned upon if they had known I was if doing they, it. Yes. <laughs> but they didn't know. So, so you built 20, and again, this is the NAMM show in 95? 95, January 95. January 95. 25 years ago right yes. now. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I, by the time I, I, I invented this thing and, and put, put some together, I was, I, I was pretty satisfied with it. I'd shown some other musician friends of mine and they were like, Dude, you got a product there. You know, yeah. it's not just you know wooden blocks and stuff. And um, so I go out to the Nam show, and the the funny thing is, there were there's always a lot of guys who are amazing players playing at the Nam show that you may or may not have heard of, especially back then pre-internet. Mm -hmm. A lot of great players I hadn't heard of. But what I would do is I, I would walk around the show, and wherever I saw a crowd gathered around some guy jamming on guitar or bass, I'd wait until they were done. I'd see what they were using. A lot of times they were using a volume pedal, especially in a controlled sound situation like a NAMM show. And uh, I would go up to them and I'd say, you know, hey man, I saw you were using a volume pedal there. And they're like, oh yeah, it's just, you know, one of those plastic boss ones, whatever. And I'm like, oh, no, that's cool. I, I was just wondering if you had ever thought of something like this. And I'd open my bag and pull out one of these. Yeah. And they'd be like, are you, ki are you kidding me? Is that zero to 10? I'm like, yeah. yeah. They're like, I've dreamed of that. I can't believe you made it. Uh, guys like Victor Wooten. Yeah. You know, and Gary Willis, a couple of great bass players, and uh, I think the guitarist for Mariah Carey at the time, another another guy, a um, bunch of great players yeah. that I met that trip, that I pulled this out and showed it to them, and, and every one of them was like, I've thought of that, but nobody ever did it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Did, were they wanting to buy one there, or you know, what, what happened to you with these 20 that you showed up with? Uh, well, I wasn't, I didn't try to sell them, because I just figured, you know, just give it to them, you know? Yeah. Um, and what I, would, what I would do is I would say, hey, why don't you just try this the next time you plug in? Yeah. And I'll come back around and like, you know, you can tell me what you thought. And so they would swap out their volume pedal right there and try it. And um, uh, actually, Phil Kagi also, he, he was there. Right. He was playing at the, uh, the LR Bags booth. And um, he, uh, he was using some other volume pedal boss or something like that. And I had met him some years before at a concert, so he you know, kind of recognized me, but mm -hmm. just as a fan, you know. And uh, Lloyd Baggs, out in the LR Baggs you know, founder, yeah. uh, he was so cool about it. He was like, Phil plugged in and, and he liked it. And uh, I said, Lloyd, is it okay if, if this just stays here? And Lloyd's like, ah, sure, no problem. Because yeah, he could have run you off. He oh, definitely yeah. could have run me off. He could have <laughs> said, no, I don't want any other, but anyone exactly. else's products in my booth. But yeah. he was super cool about it. And, yeah. Uh, he's a good guy, you know, good good guy, great products too, actually. Um, but, uh, and Phil ended up using it for the next three days or something like that. And so it's got some exposure just sitting there and yeah. having the other guys who were also playing bass or guitar through it, um, got some initial exposure that way too. But it was, uh, it was a trip, yeah. 
So you you come back from the Nam show, you've given some of them away, mm-hmm. and then 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 you're thinking, and you've quit your job. So this is at this point, this is your this job. This is it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so did you have a bunch of money that you had uh, you know saved up beforehand? How how are you making ends meet? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, had not saved up money. Yeah. Very foolishly. Uh, well, we weren't able to, but again, that's my yeah. fault. If I had stayed with selling advertising, right, could have saved up money, right, and launched the company properly. But as it was, this was you know ninety five. So in the early to mid nineties, there were some business gurus who were going around saying, "Hey, start a company with no money down. Just if you got good credit, grab a fistful of credit cards, rotate those balances." You know, they're just, ooh. Yeah, horrible, that's, that's horrible some, idea. That's some very bad advice. But, but they tickled my ears. That's exactly what I wanted to hear because yeah. I didn't have money. Right. But I had, I had good credit so I could get credit cards. And worst advice ever. You know, just terrible. So you're living, you, you were living on credit card debt. Uh, let me think. I, I was doing some little side jobs. Um, I, I was always good with computers, not programming, but good with, you know, doing some basic things. And um, so I, I, there was a guy in Stamford, Connecticut, who had a, a teaching, computer teaching thing, and so I, I would go in and teach some of his students. He, I even told him that I knew how to set up Microsoft Access databases a little bit, probably not well enough, but he threw me out on a gig or two for some of his clients building Microsoft Access databases, and uh, I bluffed my way through it somehow. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you had some some had income. some other income, yeah. But, and, and, and you've got this item, and, yeah. and so, you, so then you, you start to get some traction, and you're encouraged by what happened at the NAM show. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, when, when you have uh, musicians telling you that's the best thing since sliced bread, it really propels you forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and as, as great as this was, not everyone really uses a volume pedal, and it's only one product. Yeah. Starting a company with, with one product is... Mm, not necessarily the best idea, unless it's post-it notes or something like that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> white out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so that was, uh, you know, a lesson that I learned the hard way is that, you know, okay, well, it's, yeah, it's a great product, but how do you get the word out? And again, internet is just barely starting at this point. You know, the, the websites were like alt.guitar, not, you know, yeah. anything.com at this point. Yeah, I mean, I... I remember it being a big deal in like 96 or so when there was Fender.com. Yeah. And you hit that and it was a very crude page with their, you know, right. Fender logo and, right, a, right. and a couple, you know, very basic pictures. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so it, it really took significant money to get the word out. Like magazine yeah. ads cost a fortune. Yeah. So, um, how, so, so you were doing magazine ads? <laughs> no, definitely no. not. <laughs> okay. Well, I did end up like a year later. I, I did like a little sixth of the page in the back marketplace section of Guitar right. Player or something. So, how are you getting the word um, out? I, I got a uh, a rep to kind of handle the Greater Northeast a bit. Probably should have done that myself, but I was too busy trying to build these things. Okay, you know, and uh, you can't get out and sell stuff when you're busy making it. Yeah, you know. So, how long would it take you to build one of these? Um, well, I tried to get a subcontract factory in California to build them for me, and they sent me, I guess it was probably 500 units, and uh, every one of them was completely wrong. Oh so I had goodness. to rebuild every single one myself. It was like building them from scratch. Yeah. Maybe worse, actually. Yeah. So are you doing this yourself, or is Julie helping you at all? Or um, doing do you... it myself. Yeah. My, my dad was gracious enough to let me use the downstairs of his place. Okay. And have a big table with parts all over it and junk, and um, it, uh, yeah, that was that was that was the first big nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> there were many to follow. Yeah. <laughs> so that was '95. What happens next? Well, '96 uh, was a incredibly busy, hectic year uh, for me, just in terms of prototyping. Okay. Um, again, I'm I'm skating on the thin ice of some engineering knowledge, but not really enough. You know, I mean, I had learned quite a bit over the previous, whatever, five or six years, but, um, but still, you know, some major learning curves to get over. So I start, uh, I, I wanted to rebuild the housing of visual volume, so we came out with the VV2, the second version, right. which looked completely different. 
Um, at the same time, I, I was ex had been experimenting with other uh, guitar circuits like you know overdrive and distortion and wah wah pedals that kind of thing, and uh, came out with a visual blues, visual metal, and visual wah volume, mm -hmm. which were just like a visual volume except that the the moving pedal part in the LED display were showing or allowing you to adjust the drive level, like picture the drive knob and an overdrive or a distortion, yeah. and put that under your foot. Yeah. And so blues overdrive, metal, you know, obviously distortion. And those, uh, I thought they were the coolest thing ever because you could control your distortion level in real time. And as a player, you know, you want to keep your hands here, not just adjusting your guitar knob all the time. So I thought it was really cool. Did not take off. The, vo the wah volume pedal mm, did not take off either. I mean, people bought them. I built maybe 100 of each or so, something like that. But yeah. no big deal. You can't make a living on that. One, one thing that was, that was a major encouragement that happened uh, at that same time, um, and one day I got a, a phone call. Guy on the other end of the line has an Irish accent, and he's saying, you know, yeah, I'm Bono's guitar tech. And at first I'm like, you know, this guy's just playing a joke on me. I don't, I don't, you know, which of my friends is this, you know? Right. But no, it really was Bono's guitar tech. And yeah. I guess he, he had seen the visual volume pedal, and he said, you know, Bono saw that, and he, he was wondering if you could make a, a visual wah pedal. And I said, well, I've I'm, I'm got this wah volume. He's like, nah, not wah volume, just, just wah. Yeah. I'm like, he said, can you make one? And of course, with all the hubris I had at the time, I was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I get off the phone, and I'm like, how the heck am I gonna do this? So anyway, I, I got a metal shop to punch out some special housings and re-engineered the mechanism a bit and then just put the wah circuit in only with a switch and quite a bit of mechanical re-engineering to do there. Uh, made two, actually sorry, three uh, of these visual wah pedals. Um, kept one for myself. The other two I put a little label on the back that, that just said Bono wah. Just sort of you know cheeky little name for it. Right. And sent them off to uh, U2's management company. Cool thing is, fast forward about six months, phone rings, same guy, says, uh, hey Bob, really appreciate you making those wah pedals, that was really over the top. They, I, I think I did it for free, but he gave me their FedEx number, so I, I used their management company's FedEx number to get them over to Ireland and stuff. Right. But, uh, so he calls me up six months later, says, really appreciate that, how would you and your wife like to come out to a show? I'm like, sure. We were living in South Florida at the time. We had. You'd moved. Moved, yeah. We Connecticut winters are tough, man, especially after you lived in LA for six years. So we were in South Florida. Um, they had a show in Miami coming up in just a couple of weeks. This guy knows we're in South Florida, super kind, calls me up and says, Come on out to the show. So we, we go out to the show. Um, he uh, you know takes us backstage before the show. Um, the guys, unfortunately, the guys in the band were off of the press somewhere, so we didn't get to meet any of the band, which is a bummer. But he let me play one of Bono's guitars. I'm not sure I should even say that, but he yeah. did. <laughs> it was, you know, pinch, pinch me kind of moment. Briefly met Dallas Shoe for the first time at the Edge's yeah. legendary guitar tech, you know. Mm -hmm. Got to see that whole rig and just scratch my head going, how does he, how does, how does Dallas figure this out? It's, it's amazing, you know. It is amazing. Um, so yeah, we went, you know, be under the stage, backstage, all this, you know, on the stage. This is in, in a stadium and we're, Here's Julie and I walking out. The crowd's coming in still uh, before the show. And yeah, it was a real That's sur a, surreal moment. It's a know? rush. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was just the, the shot of adrenaline that, that I needed to keep going because we were falling into the debt spiral at this point. Oof. You know, we're, we are not making ends meet real well at all. And, uh, but that was, it's one of those things. It just it's, it keeps you going moment. So we, we kept going and uh, I started thinking of other new products for, uh, you know, that I thought might be needed as I saw my visual pedals going meh sales wise. Um, so I had, that was the, f two things happened, two product ideas, ideas came into mind. One was I thought, why don't I build a stomp box? I mean, everybody else builds stomp boxes, right? Yeah, I know and, some circuits. Yeah, and mm -hmm. at that point, that was pretty early on. I mean, you, you know, as far 96. as the, you know, the boutique yeah. world. I mean, it's you know, there was on one hand you could list the boutique, you know, builders. Ninety six, yeah, there's full tone and 
one, maybe one or two others. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you had the majors like Boss, you know, Digitech, yeah, you know, and DoD. Yeah. yeah. But you didn't just make a stomp box, you made a dual effect pedal, and that had never been done before. Right, yeah. Uh, the Jekyll and Hyde idea popped in my head. I'm not yeah. sure if the idea for the box, for the, uh, for the stomp box came in my head first or the name. Okay. I, one or the other came first, but uh, the idea of having a, a, like a, a rhythm bluesy overdrive and then a lead high gain distortion that you could combine, just like you would with two separate pedals. Yeah. Because you know, putting two gain stages together is often a, a magical thing. You get all these harmonic yeah. frequencies going on and stuff, and that's you know, I liked to do that myself as a guitar player. You know, um, so I found you know a couple of circuits that I like, Tube Screamer circuit, obviously, because everybody, even even back then, people were starting to talk about the 808 and, and all that. Yeah. Um, and then the other one, uh, yeah, I can say it at this point. The other one, <laughs> I had picked up a couple of Marshall pedals in the 90s and. Um, I liked the Shredmaster, so I, I borrowed that circuit and tweaked it a little bit. Uh, it, it didn't have a buffer, which is weird, so I added a buffer circuit to it, because I had been experimenting with buffer circuits um, at that point. I also had come out, actually, in 96, yeah, I came out with uh, the Pure Tone Buffer in 96. Right. As a standalone pedal, a buffer pedal. Yeah. Uh, so that went into Jekyll and Hyde, uh, the, the Hyde channel, the Shredmaster type, you know, yeah. modified Shredmaster channel. And, and where did you come up with the idea for the uh, for the kind of home plate, you know, shape of the pedal? Oh, where yeah, did that yeah. come from? One thing I, I knew from sales training was that you, you need to have a, uh, you know, a point of differentiation, a, a selling advantage, a unique selling advantage. And so, uh, or at least a perceived unique selling advantage. It has to be unique. You got to right. have something unique that you can talk about that other people can't talk about. Everybody else had, you know, squares and rectangles for stomp boxes, mostly rectangles. And I thought, well, if I don't want to get lost in that famous glass case in the guitar shops, mine's got to look different. Yeah. Different enough for people to go, oh, what's that, you know? Yeah. And so I came up with the shield shape, the home plate shape uh, that I thought just looked cool, you know, especially for like, you know, real rock pedal like Jekyll and Hyde. I thought, yeah, that's going to look mean, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that was that was where that idea came from, just a, a different selling point. Yeah. And so the first ones you and Julie made on your on like on your kitchen table. Yeah. It's the kitchen table that we have downstairs here yeah. at the office. It's yeah. Yeah. It's that we've still, all worked on at different points yeah, in yeah. our yeah you know, in our time here. Yeah. Our, so. our kids used to you know do coloring and painting on it, so there's still yeah. paint stains and marker yeah. marks and. But there's also like burned solder marks on there from me doing yeah. putting together Jekyll and Hyde pedals with Julie. Yeah. Um, in fact, yeah, I've yeah. got one here. This is this is one of the original uh, 100 Jekyll and Hyde pedals that Julie and I put together ourselves oh, so, from from scratch. Wow. So how so did you keep this one or did you find it later? I, I kept one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. there were 99 out there and I kept yeah. one. Yeah. Um, but I'll never forget. It was it was in 1997 when this actually came out. Um, but the first at that point we were like. <laughs> we had, we had been swallowed by the debt spiral. It was getting it was getting bad, and we you know we didn't want to go further into debt and stuff like that. So um, we were already way far enough, you know. And so I just bought you know enough parts to make a hundred of these. Found a metal shop to stamp out the housing. Um, you know, sourced the knobs, the switches, sourced everything, and uh, and we the after after putting together the very first circuit board for this. Um, I remember Julie and I looked at each other, it took forever. You know, she would help stuff all the components in and then I would put it on this fixture and flip it over and solder everything. We looked and we, it took, I don't know how long, we looked at each other and we were nearly in tears. We're like, we're never going to be able to do it. Yeah. This has a lot of components in it. I mean, it's, it's not just basic, a basic stomp box, you know. It's not, it's not a fuzz face. You know? Right, and, and it, it's two complete circuits in yeah. one box. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's that much, it's, you know, it's, it's double the work of a standard stomp box. That's right. For those that might want to, you know, or might want to look at their older silver Jekyll and mm -hmm. see if it's one of those 100, one of the 99 that are out there, right. what are the identifying features of one that was possibly made by you and Julie? I would the, be surprised if there are any still working out there. Because okay. at the time, the first hundred did not have uh, what I call a switch chip in it. It's a was CD forty fifty three, I think. 
okay. uh, switch chip in it. Um, so the switching was strictly mechanical. Right. And these switches, right. you know, they wouldn't yeah, last 20 plus years. they get dirty years. or yeah. whatever, yeah. <laughs> not, not just having guitar signal go through them. Right. So I'd be surprised if they, they did. They're, they're a lighter silver uh, than, yeah. than later ones before we ch changed it to red. They don't have any logo here. Um, but the fact of the no logo that there were some factory built ones later that didn't have logo either. Right. Um, it had a, uh, an ABS plastic battery thing, but the later ones had that too. This was, yeah. I, d I designed this amazing battery cover thing too. Yeah. Um, unsophisticated engineering, you know. But it works. But it worked. And it was yeah. cheap, and I didn't have to buy a, you know, a specially built a tool thing. You know, with a clip and everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, if you open it up, you'll see some, uh, you know, the, the, the little wire leads that come off components. You'll see some of those that are just bent over, not clipped. Okay. And that's probably a telltale sign that it's one of the original 99. Okay. Because the ones that came from the factory is later, uh, they were all the leads were clipped. Yeah. So, um, for me externally, I could just look at it and go, "Yeah, that's it." But yeah. That's because you know. Yeah, because because <laughs> I'm you rather had, familiar with it. Yes, because yeah. you spent <laughs> hours and hours making a hundred of them. Yeah. Yeah, but yes, yeah, you can. I I can tell from seeing a bunch of the other silver ones that that's a different shade of, of yeah, gray. a little, little lighter. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you also had your first foray into uh, power supplies. That's right, yeah, in 96, again, yeah. busy year, yeah. uh, frenetic, crazy, hectic, stressful year. Um, my first trip to Asia was in 96. Um, a guy that I knew in the industry uh, at, the, at the 96 NAM show, I guess it was January 96, I, I talked with him about you know, the struggles of building everything myself and, and trying to use subcontract factories in America and just you know, it was a disaster and it cost too much money as well. And, um, and they, they always did it wrong for some reason. Part of that reason was probably because I didn't give them the most explicit instructions that I should have, yeah. but learning curve, manufacturing learning curve. Um, but yeah, he, uh, this guy, he introduced me to a, a, a industry veteran out at January NAM 96, a guy named Herschel Blankenship, mm -hmm. who is a guy that a lot of people in the industry uh, or sorry, a lot of musicians haven't heard of, but people behind the scenes have heard of because he's he's one of those behind the scenes guys that has made a lot of things happen. Um, he started and founded Schechter Guitars with Mr. Schechter. You know, yeah. the whole the guitar parts business that Schechter started out as that was nobody had ever done guitar parts before. He came up with that idea. Wow. Uh, he went on to do bags and cases for lots of companies, um, but brilliant guy, and he he agreed to take me with him over to Taiwan in 96, I think around the middle of 96. And, um, and that's how I got set up with a, my first overseas subcontract factory, uh, you know, electronics factory that specializes in making all kinds of electronics, not this kind of thing, but necessarily, but, and so that was a, that was a big, a big deal. Um, while I was there, I had had this idea for a nine volt adapter that could be used with any guitar pedal. The reason being is that all of the uh, guitar pedal companies at the time, the major ones, had their own adapter. Boss had the ACA and the PSA adapter. Ibanez had an adapter, you know, DOD, MXR. Zoom, they MXR, were, yeah, yeah, Dunlop, yeah. Um, Mac, you know, even yeah. Marshall. You know, they all had the, a 9-volt adapter. Yeah. But They never ahead. said anything about compatibility no. or using their product with another power supplier, anything like no. that. So this was a first. Yeah, yeah. well, they, they all said, you must use our power supply with our pedals. Right. And so everyone had it in their heads, oh, I can't use a Boss power supply with a Zoom pedal or whatever. Right. Reality is it was all 9 volts DC, yeah. all using the same exact barrel plug, all of them center negative polarity. And, uh, and I saw that because, you know, at that point I was getting to be a bit of an engineer. And I was like, well, this is dumb. Why, do, why isn't there... You know, one adapter to rule them all, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in Taiwan, and I find the factory that builds Ibanez AC109 adapters. Mm -hmm. And I came up with this idea called the Verse Adapter. Yep. The Verse Adapter is, or was, I should say, um, it was an Ibanez AC109, but with our label on it. 
Mm-hmm. See, the factory, th- this was just a, a stock part from the factory that Ibanez bought and stuck their right. label on it. They, they didn't design it. So they had no loyalty. There was no right. proprietary design. It was just right. it was a, a factory off-the-shelf adapter. So I contacted the factory. They're like, sure, we'll put your name on it. And here, you know, What do you want the box to look like? And so on the box, I put a list of adapters that it could take the place of, you know, Boss PSA or ACA, Ibanez, Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and started selling these to music stores. Again, without a whole lot of promotional money or uh, network behind me, it was hard to get them into a lot of stores, but I just sold it to stores saying, hey, you don't need to carry these 10 different adapters. They're all the same. Here's one, and here's yeah. a reasonable price. Yeah, sold. and it says yeah. it on the box. Exactly. Yeah, all it, all the cross-references were right on the box. Right. So it, for store employees, it was easy. Yeah. But that was the kernel of the idea that led to the one, the one spot. spot, which we'll get into yeah. in a little bit. So at this point... You're really starting to get into a lot of debt. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the, okay. So, nineteen ninety. Let's go to nineteen ninety eight. Okay. Jekyll and Hyde is being produced at the little Taiwan factory now, um, which was was great because Julie and I didn't have to build them, um, and the price was you know decent. It was wasn't like super low, but it was decent, and. Uh, and they sourced everything. I didn't have to order the parts, except for maybe one or two special things. Yeah. Um, they did all that for me, which was just, I could get out to you know sales and other things I had to do. Problem is the, the factory required prepayment before shipping. So in a minimum order of 500 pedals. So I had to come up with, by selling, you know, I had to like build, build a bunch, sell them, get all the way to right. almost out of stock, buy more, Right. Sell them, get basically out of stock, buy more, and this, this yeah. kind of thing. So it's but still hand-to-mouth. Hand very hand-to-mouth. Like, hand yeah. And we're making these massive debt payments every month. And the, the debt payments were the thing. They were just, you know, we could not move forward. We could only move backward, really, financially. Um, we stopped getting into debt by, I'd say, middle of 97. Stopped getting further into debt, but we were, we were long gone, you know? Yeah. The creditors were calling us every day on the phone. Um, it was super stressful. You know, we, we felt horrible about getting ourselves to that point. You know, we realized the error of our ways, but long before then, actually, we were like, gosh, why we do this? You know, this, yeah. is, this is such a stupid, we made such a stupid decision to use this form of debt, you know. And, um, but it was too late. You know, we were, we were, we were well down that path. So uh, August of 98, we got to the point where uh, the debt payments had just killed us. The banks were not willing to negotiate with us at all. In fact, several of them told, told me over the phone, oh, well, it's just easier for us to write it off, so why don't you just go bankrupt? I'm like, are you serious? You, you won't renegotiate the terms? You just want, us, you want to write it off? Uh, okay. So we, we declared a, a, a form of bankruptcy where we still made small payments to the bankruptcy court, but not, not much, you know? Yeah. And... Uh, that was awful and stressful leading up into that. Um, but once we came out of it, it was like, okay, well, I need to get a real job now. And I, you know, I had a decent resume, but I needed a job like yesterday. Right. Because we were out of product, we were out of money. I just, I had to get money. I was, I was about to take a job doing pest control. Okay. Not because that was my life's aspiration, but because, you know, I had a wife and two little kids we were going to be on the street otherwise, so I'm doing pest control. I'll be the bug guy. I'm just about to take, start this job. All of a sudden, a fax comes in from Germany with a big order for Jekyll and Hyde pedals. I'm like, great. Throw it away. The next day, the phone rings. German guy on the other end of the phone. So, Bob, did you get my order? I'm like, yeah, man, I did. Uh, this, this guy had bought like five pedals earlier in the year, and I forgot about it. It was just at a trade show, you know? Yeah. He says, yeah, uh, yeah. When, how soon can you ship those? We need them desperately. I'm like, why do you need them so fast? He, he's like, well, I, we gave the samples to uh, a couple of guitar magazines here in Europe, and they are just publishing reviews right now saying it's the best product they've ever tested. <laughs> I'm like, great. <laughs> too little, too late, man. Yeah. Um, but I said, I, I had to be honest with him. I said, honestly, man, I am completely out of money. We are out of stock. I'm essentially out of business. I can't, you know, we have a factory in Taiwan that produces them. They've got a big minimum order. I, I don't have any money. I can't, yeah. I can't do it. 
I'm sorry. He goes, this is terrible. I, I've, we must have these pedals, you know? <laughs> sorry about the German accent. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I say, well, what can I do? I don't have money, I can't buy them. He's like, well, what if I wire transfer you the money next week? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody does that. Nobody prepays, I mean, the guy doesn't even know me really. Right. He's offering to send me thousands of dollars to go make a bunch of pedals. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, oh, absolutely, I'll send you the money next week. I'm like, okay, uh, let me get back to you. Get off the phone. My mind's reeling, I'm thinking, uh, well, that's not enough money to actually make the 500 minimum order. Who else can I call? And all of a sudden I think, oh yeah, I've got a distributor in England who has a big back order of Jekyll and Hyde's that I just wasn't gonna fulfill because we were out of business, you know? Yeah. I think, why don't I just call him? So I call that guy, take a deep breath, and I'm like, well, as it turns out, um, I don't have the Jekyll and Hyde pedals you need, and I don't have the money to make them either, but this crazy guy in, over in Germany, and I'm cringing the whole time I'm saying this, I'm like, I feel like such an idiot, you know? I'm like, this crazy guy in Germany just offered to prepay his order. Is there any chance you'd be willing to do that too? And I'm just waiting for the, you know. Right. He goes, oh sure, Bob, no, no worries. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the money to you next week. And he said, actually, double our back order, because we're desperate for these things. We're, we're, we're already back ordered ourselves, you know, more than we had ordered before. And yeah, double the back order, I'll get you the money next week. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, absolutely, I trust you, go for it. I'm like, okay, thank you. And I get off the phone and I look up to God and I start laughing because the amount of money for the, from these two prepaid orders that were coming in, which again, nobody prepays, the, the amount of money that was gonna be coming in was exactly the amount of money I needed to buy 500 units from the factory. I mean, exactly, wow. yeah. to the dollar, to the penny, you know? That's, it's, it's amazing, because it's, it's like you go, you go from being bankrupt and about to take a job doing pest control yeah. to all of a sudden you get, the, you get these, the phone call that comes in and then the phone call that you make yeah. and all of a sudden you're back in business. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm laughing to God and I'm going, so, so God, I don't know why you want me in this stupid business, but you obviously do. So uh, would you help me go talk to my wife? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because your wife just went through years. Of, I just brought her through dead. hell, yeah. through the poorhouse, yeah. through bankruptcy court. She's like, yeah, Bob, you're going to get a real job. This is awesome. Because she had been super supportive up to this point. I mean, Julie's right. amazing. You know, she's super thick skinned. She's uh, tough and loving all at the same time. She's fantastic. But I was going to have to convince her before yeah. I made the commitment to start this business again you know, that this is actually a real thing. So I, I tell her the story. I'm like, I know this sounds crazy, but this is what happened. And I think this might be a God thing. You know, I think, I think we're supposed to do it. And she's like, I mean, yeah, I can't deny it. Okay, I agree. Let's do it. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah. That's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> miracle one, miracle two. You yeah. Know? Um, just incredible. So all of a sudden you're you're back in business, mm -hmm. but now of course, partially probably because of going through through the uh, the, the logistics of, of bankruptcy. But of, I yeah. mean, so you kind of have to do things differently, but also yeah. you want to do things differently. Absolutely. So yeah. so then how are you you know how are you running business differently mm. because of the bankruptcy? Right. Well, yeah, it made a, a huge difference. Um, first of all, we we did have to get through the next you know, 45 days or so. Uh, actually, I think the, the factory was able to rush the order. I think after 30 days, they, they, they got 500 made. They were able to ship directly from Taiwan over to those distributors in Europe because they had bailed me out. I'm like, you're getting your pedals quick, you know? Right. Um, and then put the rest, uh, I think, on an air shipment over to me. Um, but during that time, that intervening time, I, I, I'd been doing more computer teaching down in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, sort of redouble my efforts to do as much teaching as I could and just, you know, any, anything I could do to bring in some cash, you know. Yeah. Um, got over the hump there. Didn't have any credit anymore. Our credit was right. shot. Because of the bankruptcy. Yeah, all we got yeah. is cash, so better yeah. stretch it. You know, Julie became an expert at super cheap shopping. You know, we were living on, like, a lot of pasta and crap, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, once the pedals came in, uh, you know, we st I, and then I had also been calling up all of our dealers and distributors and stuff. Command was a distributor at that point. Right. Um, 
and you know promoting the heck out of Jekyll and Hyde over the phone. The verse adapter was still uh, something I was able to sell to, I think, if I remember right. Uh, visual volume actually had to go away at that point because it just didn't sell fast enough. And, and working with cash only, no credit, I'm like, it's got to sell fast. You know, yeah. Jekyll and Hyde, yes. Visual volume. That was another lesson I learned was, you know, don't sacrifice your company because you love a product. You know, I love the visual volume is my baby, but just had to put it away for a while, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, yeah, so the, it came in and uh, without this huge debt monkey on our back anymore, the amount of money that we were able to make as we built and sold and built and sold pedals was sufficient to get us by, more than sufficient. Yeah. Because um, we weren't having to pay the, this huge fee to the banks all the time. Uh, again, we didn't feel great about that, but it was, they didn't give us a choice, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So then, you know, then things start kind of hit, hitting a stride and you, mm -hmm. and you, you come out with the, you know, with the H2O and the Route 66 and those mm -hmm. kind of become your kind of flagship, you know, products. And yeah, Route 66 I, was 99 and H2O was 2001. Yeah. yeah. And when does the one spot come about and how did that come about? Okay. You know, obviously you had the verse adapter. Yeah. And then, you know, which was still an old style analog mm -hmm. transformer right. you know, type power supply. So how'd the one spot come about? The one spot, uh, 2000, um, 99, 2000, I guess. At late 99, I bought my first cell phone because uh, October of 99, I got in the car with boxes of pedals and drove for three weeks, 10,000 miles across the eastern half of the US visiting guitar shops mm -hmm. with the Jekyll and Hyde pedal, the Verse adapter, and the... Um, the new Route 66 pedal that had just come out. So I, I was I was just, I was out there doing it, selling stuff out of the trunk of the car. When I ran out there, I would call back to Julie, hey, can you ship three pedals to this store or that store? Yeah. And she would do that for me. When I got my first cell phone, it came with this funny little lightweight adapter that looked kind of like what the one spot looks like today. Um, and I, and you know, being a, a bit of a geek at this point, I, first thing I do is look at the rating label and I'm like, wow, 800 milliamps, you know, that's, it's so small and light. How can it put out 800, you know, because with a standard transformer, that'd be a big honk and heavy right. thing. Right. And I'm like, that's interesting. So really, when I got back home, I, you know, took it apart, started researching a bit, discovered that, yes, this is, these are the new kind of, you know, adapters, new yeah. kind of uh, power supplies. Started working with some companies over in Asia to develop uh, the first one-spot prototypes in 2000. Um, learned very quickly that switching power supplies, which is the technology behind that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and your laptop power supply and all that kind of thing, uh, is inherently noisy. Making it quiet is a real trick, but between my little bit of knowledge and R.G. Keen, who we'll talk about in a minute, I hope, um, his knowledge and the guys at the power supply factories, we, we figured out how to take that technology and make it quiet. And then, yeah, the one spot was born. So... Uh, and it, it's it's changed over the years a bit. You know, we've changed circuits a couple times out of necessity, parts availability, things like that. Um, but it's uh, it's always been quiet. It's always been you know reliable. Yeah, and it, lots and lots. So many guys use these or, yeah. or have them in their bag as a backup at least. You know, and been such an important part of the the product line ever since. Extremely important part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Paul Franklin. I got to show you something. I've got this everywhere I have equipment. I've got a, one of these one spot to plug in all my effects. I've got them in, in the floorboard of my car. <laughs> I've got it that way, I got tired of using batteries and this, this always maintains the best sound of all my effects. So Bob, you had mentioned uh, RG before, so tell us how you met RG Keen. Yeah, um, R.G. Keene, okay, first of all, for, you know, for those who aren't aware of who he is, uh, he's a legend. And um, I say that because I like to call him the godfather of boutique. Yeah. Because his uh, website, geofex.com, and even prior to that, when he was just surfing the, the uh, what, you, what they used to call them bulletin board sites on the very, very early web, before .com was a thing, before www was a thing, there were sites like alt.guitar, alt.guitar.amps, things like that. 
and there are these weird URLs that was the beginning of the internet. And so RG would go on there and answer people's questions about, you know, uh, amps and, and effects pedals, that kind of thing. And, uh, and because of his early involvement, very, very early involvement with the internet, dispensing his amazing engineering knowledge that he, he had accumulated over decades, uh, there were a number of guys who were able to start up their boutique pedal companies or even amp companies. Um, and I was one of the early beneficiaries of, of his knowledge. He, uh, he worked for, as he used to put it, a very large computer company at the time. Uh, had been there for, you know, very ages, 25 years or more. And, you know, he was a senior engineer for this large computer company. But what he really loved, what he always wanted to do really, was to design uh, effects circuits and amplifier circuits. In fact, um, when he graduated from engineering school back in, I guess it was the early 70s, he really would have loved to get a job with, I think, Electroharmonics at the time, mm -hmm. but they weren't hiring, so he took a job with the very large computer company. And good move financially, but not what he wanted to do per se, you know. So as soon as the internet became a thing, he started, you know, putting his all this knowledge out there, and uh, and I found him on one of those forums. I put up a question is 1996 sometime, probably later 96. And I, I forget what it was exactly, but I, I, I didn't know how to figure something out. So I put this question out there and he fired back an answer and it was super complete. He knew exactly what I was talking about. I referenced a certain chip. He knew what it was. He had done experiments with it before. Wow. And uh, I thought, wow, this guy's amazing. Well, from that moment on, he and I just kept on going back and forth on little things and eventually got his email, eventually got his phone number, ended up talking on the phone many times. Uh, he didn't do the first circuit board layout for Jekyll and Hyde, the ones that Julie and I had made a hundred of. Yeah. But the first real production, you know, not me and Julie, but real production, uh, Jekyll and Hyde's, uh, had his circuit board design. Um, he's brilliant at laying out circuit boards, obviously. Uh, he helped out a lot with the, um, the switching system that was in there, electronic switching. And then pretty much everything after that he was involved with. Uh, he eventually, we, the funny thing is we never met in person. I don't think it was until 2000 or 2001, he came out to a Anaheim NAMM show, met him there finally face to face. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, he's, a he's become a very good friend, uh, to me, to all of us actually here at, at True Tone. And, uh, yeah, very, very good guy, very generous. And like I said, the godfather of boutique, he's yeah. helped a lot of people with his voluminous knowledge, you know? When I first joined the company 12 years ago, mm. and I went to the first you know, Anaheim NAM show, and RG was in the booth, and I didn't know his significance right. until I started seeing boutique uh, guitar pedal guys. Yep. The, I'm talking about the guys themselves, the guys you know who were making the boutique guitar pedals. They would see RG, and they would start coming over over to him to pay homage to him. <laughs> it's true. And I yeah. was amazed. Some of them would even start bowing. <laughs> Is that right? It was, it was, yeah. a, and, and I, I had to find out, I had to, you know, <laughs> do some research and find out all that he had done in, in encouraging people to get, you know, the housings and, and everything and yeah. where to, you know, where to source things and, uh, how to do circuits. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Huge, huge influence in our, in our industry, very much behind the scenes, but huge influence. So, Bob, who were some famous, like, early users of the pedals? Um, oh, gosh, it's a long list, and you yeah. can probably just go to, I would say, just go to the website, go to artists, you'll see this incredibly long list of a lot of people who have used our yeah. stuff over the years. But there was, um, there was one kind of cool thing that happened. Uh, in, I think it was 2003, I, uh, I had been in touch with, or I should say, The Strokes, uh, the band The Strokes, their management had gotten in touch with me probably the year before, and uh, had ordered up some Jekyll and Hyde pedals because they had been, been just buying them from stores. Mm -hmm. And the, the guys, the guitar players, Albert Hammond Jr. and Nick Valenci, they were notoriously hard on the, their gear and they would break them and they'd have to buy more. So the, their manager calls me and asks if they can get on the endorsement plan, which we had at the time. And I said, sure. I had never even heard of them before. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, yeah, you guys do a lot of concerts? Oh, yeah, we're on the road all the time. Okay, sure. You know. So they invite me out to a concert. Uh, they said, you know, name a place. And I was like, well, I, I need to get to Chicago to do some sales. So I flew up to Chicago, saw a Strokes gig, 
uh, hung out with the band. It was you know fun to meet them and just hang out and get to know them just a little bit. And but their warm up act uh, was was interesting. It was this band that I had never heard of before. That actually at the time nobody really had hardly heard of. It was called Kings of Leon. <laughs> that you've heard of them now. You yeah. Know? But uh, after they played their warm up act, I, I thought they sounded kind of like a garage band in a good way. You know. Mm-hmm. So I, I met the the guitar player Matthew. And I said, man, you know, I, I like, like what you guys did. And I, I think I've got a pedal that would, that would really suit your sound. He goes, really? And I, said, I showed him the Route 66 pedal. He goes, oh, that's cool. And, and I explained it to him. He's like, yeah, I'd love to try that. And so I said, well, just have it. He goes, you serious? You're giving, giving me a pedal? I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. They were new then. They, yeah. no, you know, they, were, they had been uh, doing kind of well in Europe, but nobody had heard of them in America hardly at all. And um, so he was really stoked about getting a free pedal. Turns out he loved the pedal so much he kept on using it. He's still using it to this day. And they've yeah. used a bunch of our other products too, our power supplies, everything. Right. And they've gone on to, you know, they became kind of a big thing. Then kind of one of the next, you know, kind of big things with the company was uh, changing the name from Visual Sound to True oh, yeah. Tone. So yeah. tell me how, how that came about. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Fast forward to 2015. We, we, did, we changed the name. It was our 20th anniversary as our company. Uh, changed the name from Visual Sound, which it had been for 20 years, to, uh, to True Tone. And the way that that happened was, um, gosh, when, we, when, we first, when I first bought this uh, office space that we had, that we have now, and built it out, and first, that was when we first really started hiring people, too. I mean, my mom joined us in 03 as a bookkeeper at the end of 03, uh, and I had some part-time guys in between there. But um, I started hiring, you know, all of you guys in, yeah. in 05 yeah. and 07 for 07. you, I think, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in 05, I, I actually, I bought this radio right here, this True Tone console radio from the 1940s, just as a decorative piece for my office. And I recognized the brand name of it because Western Auto Stores used to, that was their line for musical gear. Right. Radios and even some g- guitars that, I think they're rebranded K's, K guitars or something, yeah, right? Some were made in the U.S., some were made in, in Japan. Okay, yeah. 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 So I recognized the name from that. So it's a, you know, great name. And I, I was like... I wonder whatever happened to Western Auto and True Tone. And so I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, that's right, Western Auto, they went out of business ages ago. It was like 19, early 90s, I think. And this is, you know, 2005 or six that I was looking it up. And I was like, I wonder if that trademark's available. So I look, do the research, digging through records, U.S. Patent and, and Trademark Office, and found out, oh my gosh, for musical products, that name's available. And so I applied for the trademark, uh, came out with a pedal called the, the True Tone Clean Boost, mm-hmm. and, um, and was able to get the trademark and, and keep the trademark because we had a product with the name on it. And the whole time I, I was thinking, that would be a really cool company name. But the logistics of changing a company name is, is just a lot of... A lot of things you got to do, and it's just a real pain in the neck to change the company name. So I kept putting it off until, uh, and plus, I, I didn't want to change the name of the company until I could get truetone.com and somebody else owned that. Uh, so I, you know, I just, I just kept waiting. You know, I, I would occasionally try to put a bid out there or, or say, hey, are you interested in selling this? Is a guy in, uh, in Spain that owned it actually, and he used it for photography or something, but. He was like, no, I don't want to sell. And uh, so finally, in 20, uh, end of 2014, early 2015, I guess it was, um, found out he didn't, he didn't need the URL anymore. He was willing to sell it. So we negotiated back and forth. <laughs> and it turns out he was a guitar player, so I sent him a, a dual tap delay as well as part of the deal. And at that point, we were free in my mind to switch the name of the company. Right, because you had both the trademark and you had .com. Yeah, and, and .com. And are, yeah. yeah. Visual sound... I never had .com. I only had could get .net. Right. And that was always just sort of an annoying thing, you know. It's like ah, really rather have .com, you know. Yeah. But and the reason why I mean True Tone is just a great name. First of all, that's one reason why we changed the name. The other reason is, if you remember this, nobody could ever remember the name Visual Sound. Yes. Right? You know, if if I can, you know, kind of inter- interject in here. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was the feeling was that you had branded the products amazingly well. Everyone could remember one spot. They could yeah. remember Jekyll and Hyde, Route 66, yeah. but H-O. they had a harder time 
remembering the name of the company. Oh, yeah. And so you could call up somebody and say, this is Zach with Visual Sound. And they say, Visual Who? Oh, it's like, and then you'd say, <laughs> we make the one spot. Oh, I sell tons of those. You make the Jekyll. And then it yeah. was, and then it was like, that was kind of like. People who owned always, the products yes. didn't know the name of the company. Exactly. Was it virtual sound? Or, yes. Yeah. And we, we would get all sorts of things like that. So, yeah. yes. So then also, you know, besides, you know, the, the name change, uh, around, you know, a month or two later, True Tone introduced mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the one spot pro series. Yeah. Summer of and, 2015. Yeah. And, I just want to say that uh, myself and some other guys in the company had been kind of on you for oh, yeah. over a decade <laughs> about making a power brick. A power brick. Yeah. But at the time, it bothered me that you didn't want to do it. But then when, when you really told, told us why, because you mm. didn't want to make a Me Too product. Right. You didn't want to make a copy of what An, was Another already Voodoo had. Lab or something. Yeah, yeah. another Voodoo Lab yeah. that you had no interest. But right. it was only when, you know, that, you know, when you could do something, you know, of your own design that yeah. would be completely different. So Going back to the, the unique yeah. sales points, yeah. you know. Yeah. A unique sales advantage. Uh, but also, more than that, uh, the, the One Spot Pro wasn't just about... You know, like with Jekyll and Hyde, we made a special shape. You know, with One Spot Pro, it wasn't just about an aesthetic. It was like, I want it to be unique in so many ways. I want it to be more powerful. Yeah. I don't want it to run out of power when you plug in like a Line 6 pedal or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want it to be able to handle anything you throw at it. You know, I want it to be able to work around the world. Yeah. And um, all those things. And uh, it, took, it took us three years to design the, the, the One Spot Pro, uh, the CS7 and the CS12 initially in, in 2015. Leading up to that, it took three years. But it was it was worth it um, because we we didn't have a Me Too product. It was a revolutionary yeah. product. If you if you, if you ever watch the, uh, the the video, you know, does your pedal board really need a power brick like the One Spot Pro? Uh, check it out on YouTube. Lots of people have seen it. It tells the whole story of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was another you know game changer mm-hmm. you know for the company. You yeah. know, it was a uh, you know and and really the acceptance that we got uh, with both the name change and the launch of that product mm-hmm. line was amazing. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it sent us up to another level, for sure. Yeah. 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 Again, in that uh, same, you know, a little bit after that, mm-hmm. uh, all of a sudden, you know, there was the idea of having this show. Mm-hmm. So how, tell, tell us, you know, the how, the, how the True Tone Lounge came about. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, the, the idea for that came about because the various guitar magazines, uh, they started using a phrase for themselves. They started calling themselves content creators. Yes. We're not just magazine publishers, we're content creators. And by that, that's a, a big catch-all phrase that mostly means they all, we also do videos mm-hmm. and digital media, which is you know digital version of the magazine, that kind of thing. And that was fine. And, and they, you know, they, they did well at it, but there were, you know, with YouTube, growing by leaps and bounds at that point, there, there were lots of content creators out there. There were random guys who were getting thousands of followers just doing pedal demos. Mm-hmm. So you didn't have to be a big company to be a content creator. It became obvious to me. You, know, you could be anybody. And I thought, well, gosh, we've got some really creative talent right here in the office. I can buy cameras and lights. Jamie's great at editing stuff. Um, and then I thought... Zach would be the perfect host because you're a walking encyclopedia of all things musical. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be good for something. <laughs> all that useless trivia. It finally it was distilled down into this one point where it could That's actually right. be used. Before then, it was a liability. Now it's an asset. Well, I mean, you already were doing Ask Zach and yes. you know, the column yeah. and all that, but yeah. which is great. Yeah. But I thought this would, you know, we can we can do this. Let's. Yeah. And I wanted the program to be not about us, really. Yeah. I mean, it's called the True Tone Lounge, so it's obviously yeah. where our name's on it. But uh, whether a guest talks about our products or not, doesn't matter to me. Right. I want them to tell their story. You know, I've got a story. I've just been talking about it. Right. Hopefully I haven't bored everyone to tears. <laughs> but uh, our, you know, there's musicians out there that a lot of people haven't heard of unless they've like read liner notes on CDs or whatever. Um, that, you know, and then a lot of them haven't done interviews before. Some of them have, but let's shine some light on those guys and hear their incredible stories because they've, yeah. they've all got great ones, you know. Yeah, I, I kind of 
piggybacking on what you said, I remember the discussion we had where there was there was a lot of debate mm. over do we want to spotlight competitors? Mm. Because you know when we're doing these interviews and we're talking yeah. about their gear, you know sometimes you know obviously you're spotlighting other sure. pedal manufacturers, That's and right. and the decision was made to go ahead and do it. And it ended up being a, a, a great thing at yeah. the time, but there was kind of a lot of, uh, you know, there was a, a level of anxiety of like, is, is this a good idea or not? Yeah, I, I, I think for me, it, it didn't, that idea never really bothered me because yeah. our company has transitioned from being primarily a pedal company to being primarily a power supply company. We still make pedals. They're yeah. fantastic. Please try them. You'll love yeah. them. But uh but we are, you know, in terms of our business, we are primarily a power supply company because we do that really well. Everyone knows it and yeah. lots and lots of people are using them. So in our power supplies, oh yeah, they power all these pedals. Yeah. All of them. So why not talk, let them, let the guys talk about the, the gear they're using, whether it's ours or not. You know, it's, there's, there's a million ways to create great sound these days. Wasn't yeah. always the case, but it, yeah. you know, there are lots and lots of good pedals out there. Well, I, I want to, you know, in <laughs> right here and now, just publicly say thank you for uh, coming up with the idea and allowing us to do the lounge because it has been a great joy for me and for you know for Jamie and Dana and you yeah. and all of us to be able to because we've had some pretty you know pretty great guys that have come in and oh, told yeah. some amazing stories and uh, you know that's just been a uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. Oh, good deal. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm glad we can do it and glad yeah. everybody gets to enjoy that. You know. Yeah. And the fact that you've, uh, you know, created, you know, this business that, you know, now, you, now you've told your story and, mm -hmm. you, and we've seen the struggle that you came through yeah. and the fact that you created this environment for us to work in and for us to, uh, you know, to deal with, you know, our you know, dealers and distributors and, and all our customers that mm -hmm. we deal with and, and the way you've trained us to, to deal with them and to take care of people yeah. And uh, you got to take care of your thing. customers, you know, I mean, it's yeah, absolutely golden rule. You yeah. know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you or yeah. in modern terms, treat yeah. people the way you want to be treated. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's what we try to do. And you guys do a great job at that. Yeah. All, all of you do. So, well, well, thank you. Yeah. So, Bob, again, I want to thank you for allowing us to kind of tell your story. Oh, thanks. So man. and uh, and for our you know 25th anniversary, I think this is a really uh you know, wonderful thing to be able to, you know, tell, you know, the viewers and really, you know, mm -hmm. put put that, uh, you know, really compelling story out there. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.